Foundation for sponsoring this talk and keeping free speech alive on the American campus. I am grateful to all of you for creating a safe space for the factual <laughs> feminist. <laughs> um, and I will speak, I'm going to put on my timer. I'll speak for 45 minutes and then I will subside and take questions. I spoke a few weeks ago at Lewis and Clark College, a law school uh, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, there were, I wasn't able to give my talk. I came to the podium, students rushed to the front, the placards, they had, a, they had distributed a paper calling me Christina Hoff Summers a known fascist. And this, there was the ringleader of the group, led them in chants while I was speaking. Uh, and and she did, hadn't memorized them, so the whole time she was looking down at her phone, you know, microaggressions are real, the gender wage gap is real. You know, if you're a protester out there, memorize your chants. <laughs> 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 um, and now, why were they so upset uh, with my talk? Well, in my writings and, and in the Factual Feminist YouTube series, I do spend a lot of time correcting myths, mistakes, bogus statistics. I'll be doing a little bit of that this evening. I do this uh, not because I am a fascist. Uh, for the record, I'm a registered Democrat, an equity feminist. Uh, but uh, I do it because I think women are best served by truth, by sober research, not hype, not spin. It's critical if we solve problems. Um, we need, we need to, 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 it needs to be grounded in reality. Uh, but the Lewis and Clark students didn't see it that way, and because I had questioned some of their cherished beliefs, um, they accused me of reinforcing the dominant narrative, and they saw me as a threat to campus safety. In fact, when I arrived on campus, the, uh, this policewoman asked me if I was if I was uh, carrying a gun. And she said, it, she heard on uh, the internet that I, for self-protection I was bringing a gun to campus. Um, I might have brought my little multi poo Izzy, my guard dog, she's about that size. <laughs> she, I told her that, she wasn't abused. But anyway, um, by the way, my stepson Tamler is a philosophy professor uh, at the University of Houston. And he co-hosts co a podcast with his friend Dave Pizarro, who's a Cornell psychologist. It's called Very Bad Wizards, the podcast. It's, I'm not sure why, but anyway. Uh, he, he discussed my adventures at uh, Lewis and Clark. And his friend asked my son, uh, my stepson, he said, how does it feel to find out your stepmom is a fascist? Is it, was he said, was it like one of those Kaiser Sosa moments, unusual suspects, where suddenly you have bam, 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 you look back. That time she told me to go to bed, that time she really is a fascist. And then my son, instead of defending me, he said, oh my god. And he suddenly felt affinities with, with Mussolini. And, and, and he said, that time we were on that drive and she wouldn't stop for miniature golf. And he said, anyway, um, I say again for the record that I am a political moderate, an equal opportunity, uh, you know, feminist, and um, and it was just too late to stop for miniature golf. It was raining, it wasn't a good idea, but anyway, <laughs> on to my topic for this evening. If pollsters ask, uh, in, you know, the recent you, you, you gov poll, uh, they asked, are you a feminist? And uh, uh, the majority of people say no. About 26% uh, said yes, the rest said no. And then they, uh, uh, there have been several surveys. Uh, uh, there was a survey by Fox, and they found only about 16% saying yes. What's strange is that if you turn around and say to people, well, do you believe in equality of the sexes? Do you believe that uh, you know, men and women deserve equal rights? They say yes in a high percentage, almost all of them. And this is very annoying to many feminists because how can they believe in equality and yet they resist the designation as feminists? Well, pollsters have asked about that. And um, it turns out the number one answer people get, they, people, the pollsters will say, if you believe in equality, why don't you call yourself a feminist? The number one answer people give is they say feminism is too extreme. 
Now, there are many styles of feminism, and I'm going to defend a particular style tonight, but in recent years, I think a particularly noisy school has gained prominence, uh, and I think it's driving the agenda on many college campuses and certain areas of social media. And I believe it is taking feminism in the wrong direction. So in the time I have with you this evening, I'm going to explain to you what I think has gone wrong and how we can set it right. Now, I'm pretty sure some of you are thinking, um, well, feminism is just fine. We don't need your suggestions. Thank you very much. <laughs> and others may be thinking, um, why try to improve something that's so outmoded and annoying? Just let it go. Um, you know, that's like trying to improve rotary phones. Do you still know what rotary phones are? <laughs> <laughs> you better change my analogy here. Let it go. Well, I'm not going to let it go because the liberation of women is one of the most uh, glorious achievements of Western civilization. It's also one of the great chapters in the human struggle for freedom. <laughs> and they won equality before the law. And uh, yes, uh, it's true that struggle is not over. Uh, there are there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, women, far more than men, struggle with combining children and work, uh, the, the work the home balance. Uh, and uh, violence against women appears to be diminishing, but it continues to exact a, a terrible toll. Uh, there are still the Harvey Weinsteins in our midst. Furthermore, for many women outside the West, the quest for equality has hardly begun. Across the globe, women are struggling for their basic rights. And I attend uh, international women's conferences, and I meet women uh, who are struggling for women's rights in Somalia and Egypt and Cambodia, Myanmar, and they're asking for our help. Now, who needs feminism? We do. The world does. But to be effective, the women's movement needs to be rebranded. It needs to be rescued from its outcast state. Now, before I say more, I want to tell you a few words about my background. Way back in the last century, in the early 1990s, I was a feminist academic in good standing. I was invited to feminist conferences. My, uh, I was asked to review papers for a philosophy, feminist philosophy journal. My courses were cross-listed with women's studies. That all changed in the mid-90s when I published a book, Who Stole Feminism? Now, that book was, I thought, strongly feminist, but I rejected the idea that American women were oppressed. Uh, for the most part, I said, feminism succeeded. And to speak of American society, at that time, uh, in the 90s, as a, as a patriarchy, or to refer to women, American women, as a subordinate class or second class citizens, this just seemed to me to be wrong. Absurd, actually. Yes, there were still struggles. There were still battles to be fought. But the major battles for freedom and equality had been fought and won. Now, in the book, I tried to show that my colleagues, and in, in some of them in feminist philosophy, were taking feminism in bizarre directions. At the time I was writing, one of the leading books in feminist philosophy was called uh, Feminist Politics and Human Nature. And the author was Alison Jagger. Uh, I think she's still teaching philosophy at the University of Colorado. And uh, she defended a very radical style of feminism that she called socialist feminism. It was a, a combination of Marxism and radical feminism. She thought that radical feminism needed Marxist analysis, and she thought Marxism needed radical feminism. So she put them together. That was socialist feminist. Uh, and she, uh, one thing that amazed me was that somewhere in the middle of the book, she called for an uprising, a violent uprising. Yeah, she didn't like radical feminists because she, they ruled out violence and she liked the Marxists because they did not. And she, she has a quote in her book where she calls for, uh, she says, um, the white male, uh, she believed that the white male ruling class would give up its power, but only after a violent struggle. But she said she was confident that such a struggle would be won by the, quote, the overwhelming majority of the population whom she saw as potential allies. 
And I just read that, and there was a lot of that kind of rhetoric in the book, and uh, it just seemed a bit much to be calling for a violent revolution in, I don't know, her book came out in the 80s. Um, and, and I wondered, why was she, why was she so upset with our society, which seemed to me to be going in the right direction. Why was Alison Jagger so angry? And um, her book describes a very dire situation for women in America, for women in the world. And she said it on, on one page, she has some statistics, she said, while women represent half the global population, they receive only one-tenth of the world's income, less than one percent of the world's, they don't own one, less than one percent of the world's property, and they're responsible for two-thirds of all working hours. Now that claim, or some version of that claim, has been around since the 1970s. It's been on banners, flyers, it gets, finds its way into books, uh, textbooks, fact sheets. Um, where did it come from? Well, it's, uh, she has a footnote to Ms. Magazine. Ms. Magazine has a footnote to somebody else who footnotes it. The footnotes go on and on to nowhere. Uh, someone apparently just made it up sometime in the 70s. It's one of those urban legends that people find irresponsible, you know, just ir ir irresistible, like, you know, we only use 10% of our brains. Uh, and it gets repeated so often, it takes on the aura of truth. But it's baseless, and uh, it's been refuted so many times, and if you want to see it, one of the best debunkings in the Atlantic in 2013, uh, University of Maryland professor Phil Cohen took it apart. But in my book, Who Stole Feminism, uh, I criticize Jagger and other feminist philosophers for, for their, the fact that they believed so many things to be true that were not true. Um, that was just one example, but I, I don't know, several chapters in, in that book are just looking at, at feminist statistics that are unreliable or have no source or go nowhere or they misread something. And I just I felt that, um, and, and also, I, the calling for a radical you know, overthrow of the patriarchy, I didn't see that that was going to help women in the real world. Uh, it was almost like it was just magical thinking uh, that, that had nothing to do with reality. Uh, if I had to summarize my first book in a single sentence, it would be women are best served by truth, not hype, not spin, and not twisted theories. Well, when the book first came out, uh, some prominent feminists liked it, and I, I got some fan mail. Uh, Nadine Strassen, president of the ACLU, sent me a very nice note, and uh, Erica Jong, uh, nobody's heard of her anymore, but she had this best-selling, I don't know, fear of flying, I won't go into what that was about, but anyway, uh, she liked the book, but many feminist leaders and writers were convinced that the United States is an oppressive patriarchy, they did not appreciate my plea for moderation, and they called me names, <laughs> a backlash or a traitor to my gender, anti-woman, one critic even resorted to a gender-based attack. She referred to uh, Margaret Thatcher and Christina Hoff Summers, those two female impersonators. Now, by the way, somebody just a few weeks ago called me a female impersonator on Tumblr, and they were called out for being transphobic. <laughs> there was something strangely satisfying about that. The style of feminism I defended in my book is the style I still believe today. And I call it equity feminism. And, uh, but it could also be called John Stuart Mill feminism. Uh, Mill was one of the great philosophers of the 19th century, British philosopher. And he wanted for women what he wanted for everyone. Dignity, opportunity, liberty. And in 1869, Mill published one of the most influential manifestos for women's rights of all time. The, the subjection of women. But this book, this manifesto, is really about human liberation because Mill was relentlessly concerned with improving the human condition. And he was a utilitarian. He wanted the greatest good for the greatest number. But for him, the greatest good in society, the the, without which you could not have a flourishing society. An essential part of a, of a flourishing society was an, uh, an equality and dignity 
between the sexes, between men and women. It was fundamental to achieving progress. And uh, he said any society that permitted men to tyrannize women, as they very much did in his time, they were by law, uh, especially married women, had you know, no, almost very few rights. Um, and uh, Bill was opposed to this. And uh, he said any society that allows the husband all rights and the woman almost no opportunities to leave the marriage, uh, not you know, to, to uh, own, own property and her name, uh, any such society is uh, going to remain backwards. It's going to remain miserable. But, he said, what about a society that accorded women and men the same freedoms and opportunities? What happens then? Well, Mill predicted unprecedented progress and happiness. Under conditions of equality, he said, marriage, the family, it would become, a, he called it, a school of, of sympathy and kindness. It would, because people would be living together in love and equality, and he thought that was the basic sort of building block for love and equality in the, in, in the whole society. Mm -hmm. By the way, Mill was uh, kind of a, a, a genius, but he had his father, James Mill, was tyrannical, and he, he did not let little uh, John Stewart play. He started to... Uh, uh, coaching him. But at age three, he was learning Greek by, you know, in Latin, and by, you know, and he had to read these heavy tomes. And this bright little boy didn't know there was anything else. He, he never played. He didn't have normal friends. He didn't. He was just uh, kind of. His father was. His father thought human beings are born like slates, and he was just going to put all his knowledge and information into John Stuart Mill. Uh, Mill did have a complete nervous breakdown at age twenty, <laughs> but on the other hand, he kind of worked because he did become one of the leading geniuses. I don't recommend it, but when he wrote The Subjection of Women, he was madly in love. He had met uh, this Harriet Taylor, and uh, he was with Harriet, and uh, so in this book, I strongly recommend it because it's, it's just so, uh, he was very logical. But on the other hand, he was madly in love, and you can see it's, both pages coming together, every page. He can't, his passion shines through, but always his logic as well. Now, Mill uh, was just one of many equality feminists. You know the others, maybe Mary Wollstonecraft in the 18th century, and then Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth in the 19th. And they all made the case that women and men deserve the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So equity feminism, or liberal feminism, as uh, it's sometimes called, it doesn't guarantee happiness. It does not specify what will make you happy. It makes no prescriptions. It just promises you the freedom to forge your own destiny. It promises you, in the words of uh, Betty Friedan, that women should be able to live not merely at the mercy of the world, but as a builder and designer of that world. And it was equity feminism that informed the first and second wave of feminism. It won women the vote and you know, many other uh, opportunities. By any reasonable measure, it's been an amazing success story. It worked. I mean, just look around. American women are perhaps the, among the freest, most self-determining women in history. Uh, in many ways, we're not doing a, just, we, it's not just that we've caught up with men. We're, moving ahead of them. Things are not perfect, but as I said, by any reasonable measure, they are very, very good. And this is what Mill had in mind. Um, now, many of my colleagues in feminist philosophy and feminist theory do not see a success story. Um, they are not followers of John Stuart Mill or Mary Wollstonecraft or Susan B. Anthony. It's not that they dislike him, they just think that Liberal feminism is inadequate. Um, and in today, most gender studies departments and women's centers, I don't say all because there could always be an exception. If there is, I'd love to hear from them. Um, in most women's studies and gender studies, uh, equity feminism is not celebrated. And I've read them, dozens of uh, introductory women's studies texts. And what do they do with John Stuart Mill? What do they do with equity feminism? They, uh, they say it's a relic of a bygone era. Um, and they uh, dismiss it. It was just basically 
uh, created for privileged middle class women in the 19th century who sought to protect their class privileges and their race privileges. Uh, and they, so they dismiss it for being elitist, and then they dismiss it for being insufficiently radical. Because, as you saw, the, the ideas that were there with Alison Jagger uh, years ago, they, they're still there in a lot of gender theory classes, which is the patriarchy. It's not enough to have some legal reforms. It's not enough to change laws, or as some feminists like to say, it's not enough to just add women and stir. That will not bring equality, because they think that every major institution in the society bears the impress of patriarchy. You know, religion and literature, psychology, it's all created by man. And um, you know, so they, they're calling for a much more radical systemic change. So equity feminism is just thought to be too weak. So it's both elitist and it's weak. Now, how do I respond to that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, this idea it only represents the interests of uh, elite women. I don't understand how they can say that when equity feminism has been one of the most successful social movements of all time. Uh, it, it's, it, it has liberated women, and it continues to liberate women around the world. It, it, if you give women legal equality, educational equality, if you knock down laws that just put arbitrary barriers and give them the same opportunities as men, I mean, that's what they did. The feminist foremothers of the first wave despite their personal limitations. And they did have limitations, and, and, and they get slammed because Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of the you know, great suffragists, she was a, 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 she wanted the women's vote so badly that uh, after the Civil War, there was a big break because they, the, so the freed slaves, the men were going to get the vote, but women weren't going to get it. And she did not want the 15th Amendment to go through. She was opposed to it. She wanted to wait until it was a vote for all. And she said dreadful things. She was a very uh, headstrong and kind of uh, got confrontational. And, and she was a great woman, but she had serious limitations. And so the, the suffrage movement was split. And part of it went with her and, and to her organization. And then the other suffragists were shocked by what she did. And uh, and so the movement split. So half of the movement was in favor of the, of the 15th Amendment and was horrified by her. But yet in most of the textbooks I read, they only talk about, they just say, oh, the suffrage movement was racist. Um, it was so much more than that. And despite its limitations, it, you know, this is a movement that fought to give women the vote, to get women educated. It, these are universal human ideals. And these are not rights of, of uh, middle class women or American women or even just Western women. The women around the world are struggling with these rights. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that encompasses everyone. Um, so that's part of it. They reject unfairly. <coughs> equity feminism uh, for, I think, misrepresenting what happened uh, when, in the early days of the movement. Um, but there's another reason they reject it. They, they will say that it's, uh, as I said, not sufficiently radical, that things are so bad for women that liberal feminism has not liberated us. And they will especially say that it's um, oppressive to women because they will say, look at the wage discrimination, look at the intimate violence, the sexual assault. Um, I have looked at that. I look at the data all the time. And when I, as a factual feminist, I have about 50 or 60 videos, and every time I see, it's not always, but almost always, uh, I'll, put, I'll put it this way. If a, uh, uh, a feminist activist is coming at you with a statistic, you know, check the source. That's what I do. And uh, very often what I find is they either, they exaggerate, uh, they, uh, there's just, as I said before, too much spin, too much uh, um, misrepresentation. Reality is complicated. And it's, uh, but what they'll do is just kind of rush in with a study and declare, 
Well, let me give you some examples so this will make more sense. Uh, take the idea of male privilege. Gender scholars and activists tell us that men in our society carry around with them an invisible knapsack of advantage. You know what? That's true. But here's what is left out. Women have a pretty good knapsack themselves. Uh, visible advantages of their own. If you are willing to cherry pick, check the stretch, the truth, suppress counter evidence, you can make it seem like women today are the have-nots. You can point to the, you know, a particular interpretation of the wage gap, glass ceiling, you focus on women's vulnerabilities uh, to sexual objectification, mansplaining, manspreading, street harassment, the whole thing. Uh, and before long, you can construct a full-scale patriarchy. And we have hundreds, many thousands of gender scholars and activists who do just that. They specialize in persuading us that Venus is victimized and Mars is privileged. Here's the problem. Um, they exaggerate the plight of Venus, and they ignore the troubles of Mars. Um, most of the standard feminist injustice statistics are exaggerated or misleading. Take education. Uh, there is a place where women are the privileged sex at every level of education. If you start from preschool, <laughs> more boys are expelled. Four, four times as many little boys expelled. Um, on through graduate school, uh, this is across all ethnic and class lines. You know, people have studied families. They look at brothers and sisters. The sisters are doing better across the board. They get better. You know, on average, they get better grades, win more prizes, and they're more likely to go to college. Um, they are more likely to go to college at a time where college is almost essential, or certainly education beyond high school is essential to entering the middle class. It, wasn't, it used to be a case where you could get graduate high school, get some training somewhere, and make a, a good living. That's, those days are gone. You have to have what researchers are calling a passport to the American dream. The passport to the American dream is education beyond high school. And increasingly, you know, greater numbers of women are getting it than men. According to the Labor Department, uh, this is a big discussion in Washington now, uh, about uh, 10 million men in prime working years are, uh, it's 25 to 54, are, are just out of the labor force. They don't even show up in the unemployment. They're not looking for jobs. They do not have jobs. They are not looking for jobs. I don't know what they're doing with uh, The economist Larry Summers, uh, former president of Harvard, looked at the data, and he's concluded that by mid-century, more than a third of all men in the United States, 25 to 54, will be out of work. Now, the same, there are the same projections in Australia and Germany and Great Britain, they're worried about this too, and they have all these programs. It, there's a desperate effort at the highest level of government, and they're beginning to think, we've got, you know, and they're trying to figure out what happened, what happened with our boys? And they're going down to uh, the earliest grades, because they realize there, that there's a big literacy gap that, that, that favors girls. And uh, I don't see that awareness in the United States, um, but uh, that is a, a, a we're an area where women have the privilege, and uh, as a group, we're talking about groups, men do not. Um, there is also uh, two researchers at MIT looked at 150,000 families in Florida of uh, just poor families, different, all different uh, races and uh, ethnicities, and they found they what they found. They looked at siblings and found that. Children brought up with disadvantage, children brought up in poor homes, struggling homes, uh, often with single mothers. Uh, the boys were more seriously impacted. The boys were just more seriously uh, and more sensitive to disadvantage than the girls. And their theory is that it was fatherlessness. Is that the, you, the girls, if they, if they have a, a, a sort of these are males. And even when men and women commit the same crime, a University of Michigan investigator found that uh, men's, men are given 63% longer prisons, even when you do all the controls. They do the same kind of crime, same kind of background. Um, and now the mother of all gender gaps. 
life expectancy, women's average life expectancy is nearly uh, five years longer than men. Men must be the only oppressive class in history that are less educated, more victimized, and uh, live shorter lives than those they oppress. Uh, they're probably the only oppressor class that has claimed all of society's you know, grittiest, most dangerous jobs as, as their, their own. Look, my point here is that modern life is a complicated mix of burdens and benefits for each sex. Men and women enjoy distinct you know, advantages and disadvantages, different advantages and challenges. So my point is that if men have to check their privilege, then so do women. But my real point is, why play this game? Why do so many activists want to promote this kind of gender resentment and divisiveness? Men and women are not two opposing teams competing for some <coughs> trophy. We are in this together. Our fates are intimately connected. And uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about the way problems are described today. Take something like, uh, sexual assault and the, this uh, alleged uh, campus rape culture. Sexual assault and harassment, these are serious problems. These are, they are horrible problems. Um, but there's no evidence of, for example, a rape epidemic on the college campus. We have very strong laws against rape, and rapists are despised, rightfully so, somewhere between murderers and child molesters. And in fact, uh, the uh, one reason that we want to make sure we have due process and not falsely accuse anyone, because it's uh, such a stigma. You will be a pariah because we have we do not we're not a, a, a culture that's tolerant of, of sex, sexual assault. There are dozens of uh, studies uh, that claim it's reached epidemic levels, but when I and other scholars look into them. These claims that one in four college women are victims of rape, uh, these, they are usually agenda-driven and unscientific. The best study I've seen, it, it's not perfect, but it was the most rigorous, was done by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which sort of sets the gold standard for uh, crime research. And uh, they say that, uh, on, that campuses are actually much safer for women than most other parts of the community. But that, uh, and they give a figure of something like one in 50 students will be uh, victims of rape or attempted rape, or rape and sexual assault. Now, that's too many. And, and they may be, they, they're constantly checking their methodology. Because how can other people get one in four, they get one in 50. Uh, but their study, they, they, they keep changing it, and they keep trying to make their method more uh, solid. But I look at the other studies that find one in four, not just me, there are some fantastic uh, feminist scholars uh, that have looked into this. And, and, and uh, um, what you find is they usually ask sort of vague questions to a non-representative sample of, of people. And uh, if you're willing to do that, you can get an epidemic. I mean, I could ask all of you, I could do this right now, how many of you uh, were ever, how many of you were ever kicked or hit or, you know, by a brother or sister? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you ever kicked or hit or slapped or shut up? Oh! <laughs> Alright, I'm calling, uh, I'm going to tweet this out then. Uh, at the university, an epidemic of family violence. <laughs> Actually, brothers and sisters do terrible things to each other. It is a problem, but um, I think I have a scar from my brother who a coat hanger. Um, women, uh, so here's what gets me mad, is that it's a serious problem, and we've got to understand it. So I don't think that women who study and write about women's issues should check their critical faculties at the door. Sound policies and problems like violence against women and workplace inequities, these are going to be solved by serious research. And women plagued by violence and injustice, they're going to be helped by truth, not by some weird theory, and not by um, exaggeration and, and hyperbole. Now, where did these, where, how did this 
we'll get started. Like, why do people find exaggerated claims? And I haven't, you know, I'm gonna, not going to burden you with much of statistics, but uh, when I, I started to do the factual feminist, I told my 94 year old mother, I said, uh, and by the way, I was staying with her. She's very, my, she was with my sister in Portland. She's 94. And um, she is very liberal. She's a socialist. I think she's a communist. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's very liberal. Both Bernie Sanders supporters, my mom and my sister. And then uh, when I, after I spoke at Portland, the, because it got all over the news, because these students made such a fuss for this protest, and things like that don't usually happen at a law school. So it was all over the news. And then these new people came, and then my mother was here so well, and then Louise was saying, Mother, the students protested Christina, they called Christina a fascist. And my mother was like, you know, the whole thing. Anyway, poor mother. But um, the, the thing is that these, these twisted statistics and this carrying on, it's not helping women, it's not solving any problems, and um, that people believe them. And so when I uh, told my mother I was doing the Factual Feminist, I was doing it every week, and she said, "How you're correcting, correcting a myth every week, and she said, how many myths can there be? Aren't you going to run out of material? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> because it's been going on for 30 years. And um, now how did this happen? Because I know some of you are thinking, like, uh, well, wait a minute. How does that happen? That, uh, here, here's what I think happened. And I, I could go on about the wage gap, and I and just, uh, and I'm not going to stop with statistics, but I will, you can see the factual feminist for that. But why do these claims have so much appeal and staying power? And I think there are a few reasons. One is there are a lot of uh, statistically illiterate uh, journalists and bloggers and political leaders and even scholars. I think there is also, and this is very important, I think there is also a very admirable human tendency to be protective, uh, or at least a tendency in a civilized society to be protective of women. And I think stories of female exploitation are readily believed, and uh, skeptics appear to be indifferent to suffering. But I think the real source of the trouble, um, I would call the feminist brain trust. The gender scholars in our leading women's studies departments law schools, research institutes, they enjoy a monopoly on women's issues. They write the, the books. They create the theories. And it's, they're not inclusive in the sense that conservative women, moderate women, even me, an equity feminist, is persona non grata. If you part company uh, and, and you question these beliefs, you're automatically denounced. And that, that happened to me when I made a, my plea for moderate feminism in the 90s and it continues to happen today. Now, I hasten to say there are serious scholars working in feminist institutes and women's studies departments. I recently wrote a book on the history of conservative feminism, and I depended on these fantastic uh, women's historians in, in, at UCLA and at, at Brandeis. Um, but, but in many departments, there's a small number of hardliners and their work is seriously compromised by misinformation, victim politics, and they are captive to the women or victims narrative, and they are never going to give it up. And, but when journalists or legislatures, when they want to address a topic, you know, like women in health, or uh, oh, I didn't even talk about men's health. That's a whole other area. I mean, men, men's mental health. Uh, men completely neglected. Anyway, this misinformation flourishes, it grows, and it has shaped the worldview of, um, by now, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of educated young people who go through these programs. Um, and those who question are, you know, called names. And it's called hate speech when you question it. Uh, so you're denounced, you're, you're called a fascist. Now, okay, I have a few moments. I'm going to change my, uh, the mood and uh, to be more positive. Uh, when the Me Too movement uh, started, I actually, I wrote about it in a few places, uh, and I actually, it was, and I am very hopeful. 
that uh, it can help get the, movement, the women's movement back on track. Because they have this movement, the Me Too movement, so far it has a wide appeal, uh, conservative and uh, liberal women, and nice men everywhere, uh, you know, don't want this to go on. And um, I think that we're, maybe we've come to a time where the social contract between men and women is being rewritten before our eyes. Uh, there's no data to show, you know, that there are, there's violence in the workplace, but there was a lot of good behavior, uh, people taking advantage, and a lot of women, you know, were um, just are by now fed up with it, and, and so are a lot of men. I saw one study that like 78% of men said that if they saw someone behaving, uh, you know, in some brutish way, uh, in, in, in a sexist way in the workplace, that they would uh, interfere. So there is a lot of goodwill. And um, I think it's a profound opportunity for men and women to speak together, to begin to write the next chapter in the, in the quest for equality and dignity. In this, uh, I think it could lead to real progress. But I think it has to be a human undertaking, not something men and women, uh, were, were an occasion for women to vilify men. Uh, we're not at war against men. So I, I, what I see is the, is this movement, uh, and it's going to be, you know, a lot of young, young you know, millennials, it's, you just kind of rewrite the rules. If it's based on, as I said, just uh, mutual respect and cooperation, then I, I don't, I see progress. And I see John Stuart Mill looking down on us because this is what he envisioned, is that you want to afford one another the greatest potential for, that's how he defined liberty, and which is the opportunity to fulfill your, your potential. And with, if there's just too many men with sort of bad attitudes and about women, um, we need to change the attitudes and we need to, to move forward. However, uh, I, I'm already seeing some signs of uh, an eagerness to on uh, some part of some women uh, to impute all men. But it's not all men that do this. It's some men you don't know, generalize to the whole. I mean, that, that's the kind of bigotry. Uh, but let me give you a specific example. Uh, an ABC News, Matt Damon, Matt Damon, the actor, was there, and he expressed total support for the Me Too movement. He said it was completely necessary, but he insisted um, on making distinctions. And he said, you know, we have to be careful that we punish people. Oh, I heard it. Okay, okay. I'm happy with it. He said, we have to be careful that we punish people uh, in proportion to their misdeeds. And he said there's a difference between patting somebody on the butt and, you know, raping a, a someone or a child molestation. Now, he said that all harassment should be eradicated. Um, and, and he wasn't condoning anything. Uh, and he, he said, but he said there's a spectrum of behavior running from evil actions of a Harvey Weinstein to the, I don't know, the boorishness of her and indiscretions of Senator Al Franken. Minor transgressions, you know, people get the vote shouldn't necessarily lose their jobs. Um, in such cases, he said, you know, there should be a place for apology or forgiveness. Now, I thought his comments were reasonable and humane. Who could possibly disagree? Well, a lot of people apparently, the next day, there, you know, there were 28,000 Me Too's, uh, signatures on a petition demanding that he be erased from his next film, and progressive Twitter was outraged. Minnie Driver, uh, who, you know, his former co-star, tweeted uh, that he was, quote, systematically part of the problem. And she would later say in The Guardian, there is no hierarchy of abuse, it's all effing wrong. And her advice to Matt Damon and to men everywhere was to remain silent. And she said, the time now is for men to just listen. Well, uh, I disagree, and I'm a woman, I guess I can speak, Mr. Driver. Um, first of all, this idea there is no hierarchy of abuse, that is incoherent. That gradations of harm and degrees of guilt, these are fundamental to our intuitions about you know, morality and to our entire legal system. Our criminal laws 
are all about shades of, of and gradations of, of guilt and innocence. And I mean, telling men as a species to shut up and listen, I'm sorry, that's not progress. It's sexism. Uh, now, it, um, it's tempting to dismiss, you know, just these Twitter mobs and internet petitioners and denunciations from angry ex-co-stars. It's just a bunch of noise. But that mood in that petition, that mood of those uh, mini drivers, sounds angry. Um, I see that. It's all. It's in the media. It's in the women's magazines. It's spreading, and it scares me. Um, and it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, now there, there is much that is, uh, uh, as much that is good and important in the in the feminist movement, as I've been saying. Um, but if it's going to be effective and relevant in fighting abuse and uh, harassment and injustice, it's going to have to change. It's going to have to find its way back to John Stuart Mill, because the answer to male chauvinism. The answer to male chauvinism is not female chauvinism. The answer to male supremacy is not female supremacy. The answer to male sexism is equality, mutual regard, and mutual respect. And uh, men are our adversaries. They are our brothers, our husbands, our, our sons, our friends. If they're in trouble, we're in trouble, and vice versa. Um, so the rise of women does not re require the fall of men. Men's problems are more important or less important. They're just as important as our own. And we need a women's movement that attends to that. And I think this, in this uh, new, you know, this sort of reckoning we're having, if you don't let it turn into a, a witch hunt. And people have placed anonymous names, you know, they will anonymously place the men, the names of men, on lists on the internet, and no due process. Um, and you hear a lot about toxic masculinity. Most men, I mean, there there is such a thing as toxic masculinity, but it, it's uh, a, a small percentage of men, and and there are men who evince pathological masculinity. They, they destroy things. They prey on, on people weaker than themselves. That's not normative masculinity. Normal good men, they don't destroy, they build. And they don't attack weaker people, they protect. And the fact that we we seem to be reached a, reach a point where we've forgotten that. So that's my, just my final word, is that as, as John Stuart Mill said, uh, equity and comedy and harmony between men and women, it's the bedrock, it's the cornerstone of a healthy society. And we have a chance for that, so let's not blow it. Thank you. Because physically I'm very shaky. Um, my name is Sarah Maloney. I'm a senior here at Suffolk University. Um, I consider myself a feminist, and I'd like to openly thank you for bringing your opinion to the table today, because I think the issues that we have at hand right now start with discussion. And I do support discussion. Before beginning my first point, I'd like to establish something first off. I think it's very important to take a moment and acknowledge the fact that we are on a college campus and to take away the validity of anyone's physical, emotional abuse that has happened here or in your time here. If you have ever felt like you were in danger or you have ever felt like you did not have a strong hand in an action that was done upon you, know that that feeling is valid and know that you have a very supportive family behind you, you just have to find the right places to look. And Suffolk University's Counseling Health and Wellness Center is a good place to do that. Do you, do you um, have a question? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, we're going to have to do it. We're not trying to have all the here. No, no, it's, it's, it's actually quite hilarious that I've taken only three minutes of your time to discuss something question. that's an epidemic among campuses. My Here's introduction my question. I have an answer. I have an answer. No, no, there, there's no answer to that. Um, so, no, my question. So, my question. My question. Sorry, I didn't. Right. For, you know, for freedom, but I can't hold the microphone. But anyway, so my question is 
when we're looking at certain inequalities between men and women, instead of focusing on this binary between what is female and what is male, why are we not discussing masculinity and what it upholds within the patriarchy? I support your opinion that there are divides and that men do have certain struggles, but that is not because they are men, nor are the issues that female face because they are female. It is because we withhold such power to masculinity. And you said that masculinity is meant to build, but if first we can question what is it to be the duty of a female? What is it to be the duty of a male? Then I wonder if you would reevaluate certain areas where you say that women aren't suffering. When really the, the issue at hand is that we're not having a discussion about how to be people to each other. We're instead having discussions about what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man when we're completely disregarding sexual orientation, gender identity, race, and all things that require Instead of considering a binary, have you considered the intersectionality that leads to these issues that we're not talking about? All right. All right well, let me start with the intersectionality, because um, that intersectionality means many things to many people. There is a, as I said in my video about intersectionality in my writings, there is a reasonable version that is just good empiricism. Is it if you're a, a social activist or you're a doing social policy, you have to consider people's uh, social location and multiple ways in which they may be afflicted. And you have to have sensitivities. But, and, and I I think that, that and it's an area of research. There's, there are empirical, intersectional uh, social scientists. It's when it gets married to Marxism or married to like a radical theory about patriarchy. That's when I, Part, I just disagree, uh, because I think that whatever is reasonable in intersectionality, the sensitivity, can be absorbed into liberal feminism. Now, you talk about being sensitive to victims. The, the, the humanitarian movement and sensitivity to the suffering, there's no movement I can think of anywhere in history that is stronger than the one that actually came through these humanitarian movements in England uh, from Mill and Jeremy Bentham and, and the Clapham sect before them where they wanted to help uh, poor people. I mean, John Sorbonne, he was 17, was walking down the street and he saw blankets and he looked through them and he found a baby who had been strangled. And it, because the parents couldn't afford to take care of the baby, he was 17 years old and he, he, he was heartbroken. And then he started to work for uh, to help with birth, you know, promote birth control because of the hideous poverty. He had one of the best hearts. So liberalism, the system we inhabit, liberalism, classical liberalism, is the humanitarian movement that allowed for gay rights, that allowed for, there's no system in the world that has been as permissive. It's not perfect, it's still in progress, and for victims of crime. But we still have to have due process, and if we want to help victims of crime, say, on a college campus, we've got to understand the problem. And ideology can't come first. You've got to have, to help solve the problem and figure out what ha what's going on on the campus, you've got to have, you've got to have truth, or the, or the best, you, the, the closest you can get to truth. And what I see over and over again is hype and spin. And I, I can't tell you how much I sympathize with people who would be, and I know people who have been victimized by violence, and, but I want solutions. I just don't see solutions coming from radical intersectionality. Just to, hello. Yeah. So, uh, if you do want to talk statistics, 
I would love to point you in the direction of Professor Laveson. He's an economics professor at Harvard. He actually spoke four weeks ago. We can exchange emails, and I can send you his information. Um, and he presented only four weeks ago at a Me Too uh, panel that in 2015, a survey was done of the entire Harvard undergrad campus, and 31% of the women who responded said that they had experienced sexual violence in some form or another. That's one in three, almost. Um, that's How a did they define sexual violence? Well, to me, I think that's actually a deeper question, because you probably wouldn't define it the same way I would, and that's a problem. Um, violence to me is in any way making someone uncomfortable physically or emotionally, but if you want a rape kit, I can't get that to you. about male sacrifice a result of toxic, toxic masculinity, or if that's too buzzwordy for you, the high standards of masculine behavior that men both are held to and hold themselves to. Well, it has a lot to do with their upper body strength. <laughs> so they do a lot of the heavy lifting, and they can do just jobs that, and, and it's, women are just not, don't see, as a group, don't seem to be as interested in those jobs. So you find vast numbers of men will turn up for a job uh, you know, on an oil rig, far fewer women. So how is that a sacrifice? Oh, I didn't say it was a sacrifice. I said that it, no, I said they were at risk. They were at risk of injury. And that's one of the reasons that explains the, the wage differential. You do get paid for your job being more dangerous. So it, it explains why there could be, it's one of the reasons for a wage gap, not the only. That didn't really answer my question, though, because you Well, did why do you say it's toxic masculinity? And why, why isn't it just... Do you think there are no differences between men and women? <laughs> I'm... Well... That's a hard question to answer because I am very pro-trans, and I, in fact, identify as a non-binary person, which... So we can, we, but I mean, but my society would be one where there's mutual respect and tolerance from in both directions. But sometimes, in, okay, go on. But in your example of male sacrifice, such as the higher level, the higher amounts of men in those hard labor jobs that are riskier, and in the higher suicide rates, are those results of toxic masculinity, such as the idea that men have to be strong. They need to have that upper body strength. And so they need to do jobs that uh, better fit that, whereas women are said to not be as physically strong, and so they're not encouraged to go into those kinds of jobs. You know, and with the suicide yeah. rate, where men are taught to hold their feelings in, to internalize all of their uh, sadness and anger, well not their anger so much, but their sadness, and to not seek out help. All right. I, 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 I agree with you up to a point, because I do think that men don't seek out help, partly because I think that because we do not acknowledge enough male-female differences on average, I think male, male uh, therapeutic needs are pretty much ignored. And in Australia, they realized this. They were having high levels of just males uh, acting out and toxic. And they, uh, they realized that talk therapy, where you just sit, you know, that works very well for a lot of women. You want to go and sit, and you feel better when you talk about your problems. These guys did not. And, uh, and so they, they have 
they're now working on something called, you know, male uh, therapy, therapeutic interventions that are different. Uh, but, and the thing you see, you see, this is what bothers me, though, in some, in some of what you say. You say, well, it's the patriarchy. I never actually said the word patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you were saying it. Uh, if you're going to blame toxic masculinity on uh, social construction, um, there's just not the, a lot of evidence when you see like male criminality. It's fatherlessness. It's the absence of uh, the masculinity in their life. Um, so. And uh, conservative researchers just see if they could agree on anything. They couldn't agree on a lot, but they agreed that a society of, of, of families without fathers is going to be dysfunctional, and it's going to it takes a higher it exacts a higher toll from young men. So I, what I'm saying is, at least I want my point of view to be. I hope it's represented in the books you read that there this. Is a not, it's, not it's not just toxic masculinity, it could be that there is such a thing as masculinity, and that on average, a masculine beings need uh, you know, a certain milieu, a certain way, you know, we know that girls like school a lot better, do better at school. I think we should have a male pedagogy. We should find ways to reach little boys in school. The ways, and there turns out there are all sorts of things, and they're experimenting them with, with them in England and Australia and so forth, and we don't do that here because people immediately say, oh, that's sexist, and that's backlash. No, it's trying to solve problems. I guess our major difference is the source of the issues that All people right. have been I think we're going to have to move on to the next question. We have a I appreciate you. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, when you're looking at your facts, are you looking at a diverse range of statistics, or are you just looking at stuff affecting white heterosexual women? Thank you, Jessica. And uh, I'm you know, I try my best when I look at statistics. First of all, I ask, like, who's the most, what agency is the most, uh, you know, has the most rigorous methods? Who's researched this, or are there meta-analyses where you know somebody's looked at all the studies and they've uh, come out and shown what most researchers have found in peer-reviewed papers? So I what I try to do is report on the best research I can find, and if it's advocacy research and it's done by a group that was just there's a lot of advocacy research, and it's not on all sides. I mean, it's not just feminists that do it. You know, it's a lot of groups do that. They create their own studies. But uh, there's just too much of it. So I try to get past that and get... Now, I might have confirmation bias. We've all got that. You know, it's a very powerful force that your, 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 your rational capacities kind of acts like you're, you're a lawyer for what you already believe. You know, something comes in and you're, you're very biased in favor of information that confirms your worldview. And you're... Okay. And I um, mean, as a philosophy professor, I I hate that. I hate it when I do that. I, I've caught myself doing it, and then I just you know, and I, the way that I try to correct it is I communicate usually actually with my philosophy stepson Chandler, because he disagrees with me on a lot, and he'll be honest with me and he'll say no, no, I get pushed back, and so uh, and then I'll go. I have a group of friends who believe different things, and that's what you should have in gender studies. It can be so powerful. But, but, and that's what happens in most departments, I don't know anymore, but it used to be the case that we all have our biases, we all have our, uh, you know, set beliefs, and then what you need is other people to come and, uh, with other, you know, cancel your biases, and then you begin to get some reasonable results. And I'm worried that that whole system is broken down in gender studies, because you are not considered, uh, anybody that comes in with criticism like this, like that I have, is called Names. It's called even, even now. It didn't used to be that people were traumatized when I spoke on campus. They would just disagree with me. But now it, they've escalated, and they're traumatized. I think that's a way of it's kind of melodrama in place of argument. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Feminism, when you're talking to us even today, when you're saying that. 
everything is so much better for us, are you only saying that from a white heterosexual view, or are you thinking in mind how other women are being affected today? Well, in my work in education, one of the most remarkable things is the uh, most of the benefits of the you know the civil rights movement in, in in the United States have gone to women of color and not just men of color. The women of color and and also Hispanic women, they are right now as of, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, just started going on this upward trajectory. And there's a gap that's becoming a chasm. So I do look at that. And if you look at education, you can't say, how are men doing? How are women doing? You have to look at uh, from different social classes. And what we find right now is boys across the spectrum, working class white boys, working class black boys, Hispanic boys, maybe not the Asian boys, uh, they are, uh, they, it's a different story. It's just a different story. They, they do have intact families. This could be it. You know, this could be it. And I, I know, I know, when I mention that, people get uptight. I don't, I don't want to have to say it either. But it looks like this, what if it just turns out that we, we, we have a kind of a social ecology and like we have a natural ecology. What if it just turns out that young men growing up with fathers, and, and it's, it, it ha it's in, in a situation of poverty. You know, middle class people can make, you know, they have the advantage to make all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, com they can compensate for their poverty. And people in my family, there are a lot of broken families, and people turn out all right. But if you mix that with poverty, they now see that it's having a much harder effect on the boys, and educationally a huge toll. So why is that funny? I was saying you're not answering my question. I was asking about your personal, what you're saying. Are you thinking about it? You're telling me. I'm talking about Hispanic, well, especially Hispanic. I want to know what your opinion is when you're discussing feminism. Are you personally thinking about the other scopes of it? Because you're not really answering my question right now. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do think about, you're asking me if I'm thinking about how it affects marginalized communities, how it affects. I, I'm a liberal feminist. I care about gay rights. I care about trans rights. Of course, I don't want anybody hurt. I don't want a bullying society. I want a kind society. And you know what? I think we're making progress. Hi, uh, my name is Gina, and I'm also a philosophy major. Um, and I'm in a critical thinking class and also a feminist philosophy class right now, so I have a lot of different opinions coming at me, um, and I guess I was wondering if you could just comment on an issue that I'm having. Um, so in my feminist philosophy class, I learned that patriarchal society, um, actually just a patriarchy, uh, is an ideology that favors um, traits that are inherent in cisgendered men over cisgendered women, and these traits flourish in a heteronormative society. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on what your definition of a patriarchy is, because I think my confusion is coming in the, the definitions. Well, the patriarchy is a society where men control, uh, you know, the power, and it's it's a society that is uh, arranged to advantage men and disadvantage women. It is in our society. We're not a patriarchal society. That's as I said, that's where what society in the world where are, where, where do you, you have? Well, there's some Western. European countries. But where do you find that women have achieved what we've achieved? This is what gets me. I was this is why I wrote that book in the first place, because I would sit in my classes at Clark University, more and more young women, fewer and fewer men. At that time, Clark was a lot of kids' first generation going to college. This was a big step, their families up. But it was more and more girls. And then they were they were learning and they and they were fantastic. These girls were, you know, going places to fewer and fewer boys. But yet that was the time we burdened them with these dreary theories about a patriarchal, oppressive society that has nothing to do with this dynamic democratic society of ours. So I don't know. It worries me that you're in this feminist theory class. I mean, look, if I were Zarina, and I'm not, but if I were, you know, fine, I would have that stuff in my class. People could read it. It'd be fun. And then I'd have a good refutation to show where it goes wrong. That's how I taught every philosophy class in my life. I thought it was an unwritten commandment of college teaching. Thou shalt teach both sides of the argument.
policy student like you was wrote something that I think was in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And, and uh, he said that when he takes a philosophy class and you read something, you just, the whole class kind of goes after it. You know, you could read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, and Mill makes some mistakes. You go after it, you find what's wrong. Uh, you can read Immanuel Kant, and it, you know, a lot to attack. Uh, <laughs> a lot to learn, but. Um, but here, it's this uh, very critical. And he said in these gender studies classes, you know, a lot of the texts were, were was received wisdom, and that a lot of the readings were mutually reinforcing. You can't, that's not education, it's indoctrination. Now, I don't say that it goes on in all classes, but it, it goes on in a lot of the textbooks I've been looking at. So, that's all. <laughs> Did that help? Yeah, it did. Thank you. So, so when I was kind of listening to it, I was kind of following along um, to about, especially about uh, male privilege. Um, I know that's one thing you said was incarceration, but the one thing I felt like you missed was you didn't really talk about the absolute mass incarceration of both black and Latino folks. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think I did. I think I did. Yeah. I talked about what happens. What happens in the fatherless homes? Um, what was it? Oh, so kind of following your logic, would you honestly consider, you know, black Latino men being arrested, mostly over misdemeanor example of, you know, black privilege, Hispanic privilege? Because following your line of reasoning, that's what it would be. Well, I didn't really. Did, did I talk about that? No. 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 She didn't. That's okay. I didn't talk about that. What's up? I want to know. Um, I would. Uh, what I would do is, a, it, 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 you know, is a, it, an empiricist is to try to see what's going on and try to find out why. Why is this happening? Now, I do think we incarcerate too many people. That's something that, by the way, liberals and conservatives and libertarians agree on. So uh, that's an area where we can cooperate instead of hating on each other. You know, everything's so divided in this country right now. Uh, but there are things we agree with. And then, the, and then, yeah, that's what people are asking. Uh, why, what has happened with African-American young men? Why these high rates? What has happened with Latino boys? And the girls doing so much better. And, and, and I don't want to keep harping on this, but uh, if you look at, um, I would just recommend that you listen to two, two scholars, African-American scholars, uh, Glenn Lowry and John McCord. And they have a, these are two brilliant professors, and they have a uh, podcast, I think it's called Logging Heads, and they talk, and and they bring in other people, and they have, they, they disagree with Black Lives Matter, and they're, they're mad at Ta-Nehisi Coates, they don't agree with him, and they, but they, you know, I don't see them, you know, getting a lot of publicity, you hear more this view uh, that it's because of it's a white supremacist society. I think you should listen to them, they have a you know, they admit there's racism, they have suffered it, but they also think that there are problems that have to be addressed in terms of education and in terms of family instability. So that's that's how I would look at it. I wouldn't go for some uh, something in the sky. I would just try to solve the problem. You can't pick two conservatives and then think that's middle ground. I mean, they're, I think they're both Democrats, but never mind. No. Well, if I can make a suggestion for you, um, there actually is a nice little documentary on Netflix called 13 that will answer the first question instead of why this is happening. Um, didn't really answer my question on all words with black privilege and I play. But I, 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 I talked about male privilege, male privilege. Do you think that uh, black men have male privilege? Oh. 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 Mary Driver. Mini Driver. Mini Driver, sorry. Uh, you had said that uh, her dismissal of what you said. Well, first, let me go back. So he was uh, introducing a little reason to the. Reason and nuance and right, right. distinctions. And she was dismissing him and saying. Uh, yeah, she uh, said it's all 
go. She didn't want, and it wasn't just her, by the way. It was also Senator uh, uh, Gillibrand. She when she wanted to get rid of uh, uh, Senator uh, Frank. Okay. All right. So my question is this: uh, You were saying maybe we should just immediately dismiss what she said, but it gave you pause, and you said, "Wait, but this scares me." And my question to you is. Uh, does it really scare you? I mean, don't we just know? I'm looking at you right now. Don't we know that that's not worth paying attention to? I mean, like a lot of people in this room, I pay attention to a lot of people on the internet. And there are six or seven people who I really care about. But as if I know you, you don't know me, you've never seen me before. I'm sitting there nervous because I, I, I love you so much, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we only have so much time on Earth. What are you doing paying attention to a uh, mini driver? I mean, it, don't we just know that that's not worth paying attention to? It, All right. Your life is your attention. Right. Now, uh, that's a very good question, and that's actually both of my sons tell me, you know, like, this is not happening, the things you're describing are not happening, but, you know, a lot of people in the back there who completely disagree with everything They're I said. They're on their phones, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I would like... I, I would like maybe that they just hear a different point of view because I think that it worries me to have a society where people are in their bubbles and they just never hear the other side. You if you are a student and you are a conservative and you are in a university, you will hear the other side. Yeah. <laughs> but if you are a very She, uh, three pages that were... Uh, oh, yes, that was a pre -bubble. She rebutted me before I came. Yes. Uh, I just want to point out, not one citation. Um, my question is, uh, I'm, a, I'm a software engineer, and one of the scariest things is the infiltration of social justice into the field of engineering. Uh, specifically, in a dean at Purdue University saying that um, being rigorous in your calculations is an example of toxic masculinity. Um, it's my professional opinion, if we think being having rigor, if we think uh, uh, being precise in our calculations is something wrong to be feared, um, defense systems will stop, fail to protect us, medical devices will fail, bridges will fall, and people will die. Yes. What's your question? Uh, are you as scared as I am about toxic femininity in engineering? <laughs> better uh, spatial reasoning skills, uh, women have better literacy skills, and um, if you give kids vocation tests, you take, you take girls and boys in junior high and in high school, we have a rich literature about what interests you, what would you like to be, and they will ask a 15 year old, two 15 year old, would you rather have a job where you uh, took a, a machine apart and put it back together? Would you like to do that for a week, or would you rather sit uh, with a friend and discuss problems, or sit with a group of people and help them solve their problems? Now, um, far more women than men say they would rather have the job of talking to people about their problem, and far more men want to take. Now, there are women for whom it would be horrible, and they want to they want to be with that machine. But there aren't as many. It's a statistical difference, and it's going to show up in the jobs you choose. And sure enough, if we look at the configuration of people in the in the uh, job market, women overwhelmingly gravitate to the nurturing and caring fields. Uh, and the men are overrepresented in, I don't know, people-free zones um, and uh, in engineering. And then, and then women take, you know, one of the reasons there's a wage gap is that men, uh, their majors are more likely than they are for women to be in 
economics, uh, the highest paying major, or engineering. But if, if the biggest major for women is in education, or early childhood education, or psychology, social worker, they pay less. Facts. They pay less. Now you can say, well, that's not fair. They should be paid the same. Well, uh, it's determined by the market and how, you know, what the market will. <laughs> and I think young women know that now. And if someone had come to me, I made a philosophy, that's not entirely practical, uh, but if someone had come and said, oh, you can double your salary by being a, a, you know, a nuclear engineer, uh, I'm not sure I would have changed. I loved what I was doing. Most interesting finding, and I'll shut up on this, the most interesting finding, it's been corroborated, and again today, another big study. You know, there are more women in engineering and in, and in the, uh, uh, in physics and math, it, it, it tracks with um, equality. The more equal and prosperous a society is, the less likely women are to go into math and physics now, and, and engineering. Now, why should that be? So, if you're in a country that, where people are struggling, if you're in, in, in you know, if there's less prosperity and less equality, India, you'll find uh, more women going into engineering because they have to. And in American society, and much of Western Europe, it's so prosperous, and we have more, more opportunities for self-realization. And you can just do what you really want to do. So you want to be in art history? You want to study Victorian literature? You can. And, uh, or you, you know, not necessarily you can, but you have a better chance uh, than if you were in a poor country. So not all differences between men and women are necessarily the result of discrimination. They could be the result of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, so, I was wondering about your thoughts on the difference between equality and equity, because you describe yourself as an equity feminist, but when I see um, equity talked about these days, it seems to me to represent more um, like a desire to see equal representation and results in all dimensions in all levels of society, which seems to me not quite ex uh, the same as what you're saying, which is more to do with the quality of um, Opportunity. rights. Opportunity. Yeah. Uh, That's exactly that. right. That is what John Stuart Mill feminism is. That's what equity feminism is. If you want to give everybody a chance at self-realization, as they just determine it. And, and I would doubt that, I, I suspect, I'm not sure of this, because here's something, we don't know how much is nature and how much is nurture. It looks like it's a complicated mix of both biology and culture. But I would guess that uh, men and women, on average, take somewhat different paths towards self-realization. Just, there's just a difference in, you know. But, again, I'm, uh, I'm waiting, you know, maybe in 50 years we'll eliminate that difference. We'll all, it'll be 50-50. I haven't seen it. Uh, I have people have tried to get little boys and girls to play the same. The kids rebel, uh, and you know, but maybe kids will change. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, so I've yeah, definitely equality of opportunity, not statistical parity between the sexes. And I don't. I just don't see sameness as a, in, indicative of liberation. I see self fulfillment and happiness. And, how, you know, were you able to do what you wanted to do? That's, you know, an opportunity for society. We're not there yet. The United States of America, people don't have the same opportunity. But we're, there's a lot of commitment to improving, to making it better. And I don't know of any society that's trying harder than we are. So that, that makes me hopeful that, that we will arrive at Mills, you know, the greatest group the greatest stuff. But we're not there, but we're on the path. My name is Tara Lily Clancy. I am a history major, I pronounce that word, history major specializing in historiography, and I am a woman. Getting that out here now. Now, you mentioned earlier a number of um, suffrage activists, and among them, I think possibly the only black woman on the list was. Sojourner Truth, and while it's a bit cliched, she did have that wonderful speech, Ain't I a Woman? 
And that's a question I find myself asking a lot. That is a question which other people seem to ask of me a lot. Am I a woman? But they typically seem to have the answer predetermined. Typically their answer is already no. And far too often I have heard that from feminists um, who believe that I am not allowed to be part of feminism with the near 100% exception of intersectional feminists. They have never said that to me. They recognize that I am a woman, that issues affecting me, issues affecting trans women affect all women, and that this is not some sort of <coughs> problem that can be ignored or swept under the rug or is not under the purview of feminism. Feminism should exist for all women. So, when we get down to it, my question is, how exactly can the good things that you seem to think exist about intersectionism be incorporated into liberal feminism when liberal feminism has never incorporated those things, when existentialism exists solely because liberal feminism has always excluded marginalized identities within women. Where, where could there be a trans movement other than a liberal democracy? Where? Well, basically everywhere. We've always existed and we're always fighting. Yeah. I am, want a tolerant society, and I think you, you know, we're not there yet, but where else would you go? Yeah. But, you know, where, where are people, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, uh, Holland, possibly. Yeah, maybe Norway. I don't speak Dutch, but um, <laughs> when we get down to it, there seems to be a big divide as to a confusion to the belief that best is necessarily good. Simply because we are better than the world does not necessarily mean we are remotely good. The fact that we stand ahead of people who are light years behind does not mean we are any closer to anything resembling an equal society. Now, you're asking where I'm going to go? I'm going to go upstairs where there is a... Uh, where there is a meeting about uh, people who are going to discuss how to oppose this sort of thing. I'm going to- wait, wait, allow me to finish. I'm going to, you talk about allowing people to convince each other? That's what I'm going to learn to do, because I've seen here today that far too many people in Suffolk are convinced by the rhetoric of the past and are completely ignoring the fact that our past was built on blood and oppression. Woo! Yeah! We... I'm going to learn to convince people that you're wrong. Have a nice evening. Yeah! I will respond by just saying I, I, I'm here to have a discussion. I think the best way to overcome a, an oppressive tradition is friendship, is openness, is, is easy going.
But don't bring in like radical theories that treat our society as if it's just a crime scene. It's a, it's a complicated and, and, and vast country that's uh, struggling and, and has a record of astonishing failure, but astonishing progress as a state. that were shackled and forced to work for your ancestors. What are we building on? You're building on death? Oppression? What are we building on? I want to know. What is this heritage that we have to build on to be better? To uh, have you, did you hear that we had an abolition movement? We had a civil war. Oh, by a few older kids who told me that I did not respect myself. A child. A child that did not respect herself. A child that was plagued with sexuality that I am still being plagued with right now. So my question is, will I have depended on my femininity in order to be strong? Will I have clung on to that even though it has been strong against me? How can you say that is toxic? How can you look me in the eyes and say that that is toxic and that is ruining the society that we have? That is the question I have. I, I, I don't know. Think you're toxic? I didn't say yeah. toxic. Not me, but femininity. Femininity as an idea. Femininity as an idea, which is only femininity. Which is only intersectional. That is the point that we're trying to make. It is supposed to be intersectional because that's the only way that all of our voices can be heard. That is the only thing. I'm not here to fight. Liberalism is intersectional. But you're saying that intersectional feminism does not exist. Yeah, intersectional feminism married to a right. radical theory of the patriarchy. But we're not, but we're not supposed to be focused on the radical ideas. That is not what we're here for. That's we are the, we're right. on the college campus. We are the beautiful middle. We are the ones that are fighting. We're not the grasshoppers. <laughs> that's not what we're here for. Well, what, and that's, that's what I'm trying to say. That's all I'm trying to say. And I'm, ho I'm hoping to God that you will understand. That's all I'm trying to say. I just hope that you find a way to treat one another in this school with openness and a spirit of friendship because what I see on some campuses is tribalism and people are retreating into their identity groups and not making friends. And the way you overcome this is by familiarity and Unfortunately, uh, it's been carrying on for a while, and uh, we have to wrap up the event a little bit. So, one more question. Hi, can I hold the mic? I thought you said that. Yeah, um, Melissa! <laughs> my name's Melissa, and I am a feminist. Um, so, you talked about how um, our culture is too intolerant of sex crimes. Um, uh, in a report from the... Too intolerant. Not, we can't be too intolerant. We're intolerant. Okay. So, we're intolerant of sex crimes. Um, so... 
Uh, the Bureau of Justice reports that for every 50 cases of first degree sexual assault reported to the police, only uh, one of those offenders is actually incarcerated. Um, so what do you think? Fake statistic. All right, so how do you propose uh, uh, we be more tolerant of sex crimes in our country? And for the record, first degree sexual assault, um, I know you have skewed definitions of sexual assault. So that's uh, having in -course, intercourse with someone uh, by force. Or a child. Let me just say this. You, you can uh, almost eliminate any crime if you want to have a police station. And so you, you terrify people, and you have a panic, and you lock people up, and you have draconian punishments. You can get That's not our system. We err on the side of the presumption of, in, of, of in, the presumed innocent. We have due process. It doesn't always work, but that's our ideal. And what I'm seeing on too many campuses is this combination of, the, of a, a kind of sex, you know, kind of a moral panic about sexuality, and then people want to rush in and deny people their rights, and you become guilty because accused. And I've seen like hideous cases on campuses, so that's what I'm addressing. That's why I wanted to stay with you. People are found guilty who are accused. Do you think that 50, every woman who uh, reports first degree sexual assault, 49 of them are lying? It's just about what, it's, the Washington Post uh, did a story about that statistic a few years ago, David Freeman over here, they said, there's no, there's no source, what does it mean to have Accused, accused by whom? Did go to the police? Did go to the courts? What are you talking about? I would like to know how she I was able to make it up to the woman. Oh, yeah, no, uh, uh, like, All right, guys. Shut up. Thank you. 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 Nonetheless, um, I most, uh, most questions. Now we're going to just wrap it up. Um, let's all give a round of applause. Thank you.